Hi, I'm Karen Brown of Just Get It Done Quilts, and welcome to my interview series, Karen's Quilt Circle. Are you the type of quilter that sees quilt ideas everywhere you go? Do you find yourself sketching on the back of napkins or in the margins of magazines or even on the computer? Or how about seeing patterns when you shut your eyes at night? Then I'm sure you've thought about taking it to the next level and trying to sell your idea. But how do you actually go about doing this? And is it worth the time and effort? Today on The Quilt Circle, I have Bobby Gentili from Geeky Bobbin with me, and we are going to talk about how to get published as a pattern writer. She is an experienced long armor with clients like Libs Elliott and an internationally published pattern designer. I had a ton of questions and she patiently answered all of them. So grab your sewing, grab your cup of coffee, and here's my interview with Geeky Bobbin. Welcome, Bobby. Great Thank to you for be coming here again. today. Um, tell me, how many designs did you come up with before you finally took the leap into publishing? The very first quilt that I made was my own design. I didn't realize that people bought quilt patterns. Um, I was kind of baffled that people needed patterns, needed somebody to tell them the math, and they didn't just, you know, draw a thing and then instantly know the math for it, basically. That was an interesting realization. I, so I think, um, like, I followed one and a half patterns, two and a half patterns ever. The very first one that I made, I knew that I um, wanted to release that as a pattern uh, because I was not happy with the um, Tetris quilts that I saw out there in the world. Um, my first quilt that I made was a baby quilt um, and I started off making a Tetris quilt. It was going to be a um, granny square blanket because I was going to crochet it and then I thought oh no I'll try and make it as a quilt. I got some tips from friends um, and you know I mean it's a bunch of squares and so you know I can sew a bunch of squares together. Who needs a pattern for that? I just need to know how many squares. Um, and uh, I laid it out. So my problem with the um, my problem with the Tetris quilts that I saw when I googled was that they had all the blocks, but they were arranged in a way that no self-respecting Tetris player would ever <laughs> be satisfied with. So I don't know who these Tetris quilts were for, but they're certainly not for, I mean, unless somebody's trying to have the maximum number of gaps and never get a completed row um, is basically what it looked like. And at the same time, I was seeing modern quilts from some of my crafty friends who were members of the MQG and their local modern quilt guilds. And I really liked, you know, the long strips and stuff. Um, so I rearranged this Tetris game so that it was a beautiful, uh, balanced, um, modern piece of art and also a game that any Tetris player would be happy to be starting because you're, you can see that you're two moves away from getting four in a row. Um, so that was my first pattern um, and I ended up actually releasing that as my first pattern and um, I had a few other ideas that were sketched out uh, when I released that one but once I started working with new patterns, new fabrics that were um, not out yet, I started to draw inspiration from, oh, what can I make with that fabric? And oh, what does that line um, bring to mind? And so um, now I've got more ideas and patterns in my head than I can possibly ever make in life. I find I get them everywhere. I mean, I see, I get them in, from motel bed, <laughs> motel bedspreads and things like that like you just sometimes the light just hits things I can remember watching just recently watching an, um, a video on origami and I was just so entranced by the paper and how when they unfolded everything the pattern on the paper and I was going I can yes. quilt that I can yeah quilt that. <laughs> my second I guess pattern that I released maybe third um, was this one called intersectional and um, this is the first way that I made it was um, in those colors, um, uh, was made as a gift for my cousin's birthday and she's an architect. And the cover image on her Facebook page for her professional page was this like very similar to that, like a concrete installation or, you know, some kind of artwork that was like a whole bunch of different 
faceted diamonds um, forming hexagons made out of different colors of concrete. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of how it goes. You see a shape and it inspires something in you. And then, you know, so I made that gift and people started asking for the pattern. And I was like, oh, I hadn't thought about sending that as, selling that as a pattern, but I will. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about three different, well, for, there's three different ways you can publish a pattern. So you can publish in a magazine, you can self-publish, and you can um, talk to a printing house, a publishing house about it. But today we're just going to talk about the first two. So um, number one, submitting to magazines. Mm -hmm. um, you've done this. What do you need to do first? Well, so the first thing you have to do is uh, look around at what different magazines there are. Um, you want to pick one that is a similar aesthetic to the quilts that you make, um, and in particular, the one quilt that you're planning on proposing. So, you know, you wouldn't propose a very um, traditional quilt made up in primitive fabrics to a very modern magazine. So you want to take a look through, you know, flip through their social media, flip through their website, um, or a physical magazine, uh, they still exist, and, uh, you know, see if they're a good fit for the quilt that you want to propose. Um, you can find that information, you know, like I said, on their website, social media, in physical magazines, take a look at the newsstand, or ask your friends what their favorite um, quilting magazine are and then take a look and see what their aesthetic is. So do they have a spot on their website or in their magazine where you submit them or? Yeah, most of them on their website would have um, submission guidelines. So some of them will have a form that you just, you know, type in your information. Maybe you can upload the picture straight from there. Other ones will have uh, submission guidelines that will tell you um, how to submit and like the whole deal. Some of them say how much they will pay and some of them uh, will just tell you what you're going to be responsible for getting to them and what their process is like. Um, I think for most of them you just, there will be an email address and they'll say what they would like you to provide um, to um, start the process. And are you submitting pictures of your quilt or pattern? So you don't have to have a pattern. Um, you don't have to have like a written pattern instructions um, diagrams thing. You have to have a sketch. For most of them, you just have to have a sketch already of what your idea is and what fabrics you want to make it in. Um, and, you know, maybe a description of how it's made, you know, this is half square triangles or this is paper pieced. Um, and you can submit that like a sketch either on paper, just take a picture of a sketch. If you've already made the quilt, then that's, you know, you're, you're a little further along. You can send a picture of a made quilt or you can send just your sketch of what um, the block looks like or what the quilt looks like. A few details like the size, um, it'll depend on what they, um, what they ask for, but that's basically it. Okay, so you write an intro, you make a little sketch, you submit it in, now what? Now you wait. Um, some uh, magazine editors will get back to you right away and they'll tell you either a yes or a no or a yes, but we're not sure when or something like that. You might be lucky and you might hear a yes right away or maybe a no thanks right away. Uh, but I mean, magazine editors get so many submissions that they might not get to um, giving you an answer right away. So, um, you know, give them a couple of weeks, maybe follow up after a month or so and say, hey, I wanted to um, check in again and see if you've had a chance to look at this. Um, but, you know, don't expect an answer necessarily the next day. So can you submit the pattern to multiple publishers at once? That's frowned upon. Um, that would be kind of like asking multiple guys to the prom. Um, wait until one of them says no before you um, offer the goods up to someone else. Um, it would be really icky to have to say no to someone else after they already said yes to you. Um, so stick with one. If you've got like pattern ideas coming out of your ears, then you should have no problem, um, you, you know, dividing them up and conquering. Um, and once you do hear a no from someone, you can send it to one of the other magazines as well. 
Okay, so let's go with the the best case scenario. You get a yes. What's next? You get a yes. <laughs> That's awesome. So then um, you'll get a yes, and you'll also get a contract uh, from the magazine. They'll tell you how much they're going to pay you, what you're responsible for delivering to them, uh, whether they want you to send them the quilt or if you're just responsible for taking pictures and sending the pictures in. Um, all that good stuff will be outlined in the contract. Any um, details like timelines, deadlines, um, who owns the pattern, when you might be able to uh, sell it somewhere else. So a lot of times when you submit to a magazine, um, they have exclusive rights for a period of time. And then after that exclusive period, then you can um, sell it on your own in like a booklet or whatever or um, somewhere else other than the magazine but they usually want some period of being exclusive. That sounds like something that people should be reading the fine lines for to be sure that that's that copyright returns to them and just not sign blindly. Yeah and also I mean read read every line of that contract. Um, you you own what you, uh, in most of them, so what, what I've experienced is you own what you submitted to them. You don't own the edited version and you don't own the pictures that they might have added or any diagrams that they might have done. So if you are going to make your own pattern booklet afterwards, you would be responsible for making that stuff yourself. So, um, so does that mean you don't have to actually submit a formal pattern? You just send in the details and they make the pattern? It depends. Um, yeah, it depends on what um, what you agree to in the agreement. Some magazines will ask you to have, you know, finished diagrams. Please send the um, Adobe Illustrator file, uh, and you know, have have each diagram on its own artboard kind of thing, like levels of detail. And some of them will say, um, send pictures, send clear pictures of each step. Photos are preferred. Um, some of them you know don't so it, it really depends on what that magazine needs and um it can be i would say proportional to uh what you get paid as well because if you if they've got the staff on hand to do all of that artwork for you um then you're probably going to get paid a little bit more maybe i don't know and what happens since you just had a sketch of this Mm -hmm. What happens when you begin to make it and it doesn't actually, you run into problems. Uh, some part of it could not actually be made or Ooh. it's not easy to make. Uh, I don't know. Everything I do works out perfectly the first time, Karen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would say that like if you're going to submit a, a pattern, you should have a pretty good um, a comfort level that it's viable. So if you know if you make a block, if there's if there's a block based design, you should be able to make a block before you send it. Probably, um, you would want to test it. Ideally, you know yourself and somebody else, so that your instructions make sense to other human beings um, and not just your own. And that's another thing that might be. Uh, written out in the magazine, but I mean, if you if you really run into a wall, you haven't gotten paid yet, and so you you wouldn't get paid. Or I mean, you know, you could always negotiate um, some changes with the editor. At that point, you'd be in troubleshooting mode for sure. Right. Um, and then the last part, of course, is you get paid. You get paid. Yes. Um, you get paid at some point. You get uh, a copy of the magazine, probably. Um, you Do you get might... many copies? Do you get any copies? It really depends. Again, that's all in the contract. So I've gotten one where I got two copies of the magazine. I got one where I got one copy of the magazine. And another one was a digital only magazine. So I got a copy, but I was already a subscriber. So um, I gave that one away. Yeah. Okay. And the million dollar question is, when do you actually get paid? Do you get paid when you're published? Do you get paid when you submit? When do you actually get paid? Uh, that also varies. So um, I have had one where the contract said that I would get paid when I had received, when I had submitted all of the deliverables. So in that case, it was sending them the quilt and all of the instructions and diagrams. 
Um, I invoiced them at that point and then I got paid like a week or two later, something like that. Uh, and then I've had other ones where you get paid after the magazine is actually published. So it's, again, you can look at all of that stuff in the contract. Some of it might be negotiable. Some of it might not. And what kind of timeline are we looking at? Are we looking at a year from uh, contract or six months or? It might be a year for some of them. I've had some that were really short, but I knew in advance that they were going to be really short term turnaround. So I found out um, in September and I knew I needed to get everything to them by the end of October. Um, and then, yeah, payment was 30 days after that. Uh, and then the magazine was published in February. Um, I've had other ones where it was a really quick turnaround and if I had had the pattern already written, it could have, um, it could have gone into the very next issue potentially. Usually the editors have things planned out for a few issues already. Um, you know, there's that problem situation that you talked about where, you know, what if, what if something doesn't go as planned and you, you know, run into a hiccup. Um, with either writing the pattern or, you know, I mean, life happens, right? Um, you can probably talk to the editor and negotiate whether it, you know, moves to a different issue or something like that. If, if they said yes, then they like your design and they want to include it. Um, usually, I mean, some magazines have different themes for their issues, so um, it might not necessarily work with, like, if, if it was a Christmas quilt, um, it'll go in the Christmas issue, but not necessarily work for their summer issue. So um, there's those kinds of things where they have to be a little bit more strategic about that. Um, so that influences um, how far out you would, uh, you would be scheduled. Right. So you're doing this and then you think, why limit myself to the few hundred dollars that they're actually gonna pay me for this pattern? I'm doing all this work. I want it all. <laughs> so go into publishing it yourself. Yeah. Um, are the steps any different to self-publishing? Um, the steps are a little different because you don't have that gatekeeper of the editor to say, um, hey, this is a good idea. Um, you're kind of relying on yourself and whoever your trusted circle is to, um, to give you that guidance of whether it's something that you want to go ahead with. Um, you are the only one that you really have to answer to if you do run into something and you decide not to do it. Um, some people are deadline driven uh, and having that deadline really, you know, is motivating and helps you to get things done. Um, and if you don't have that deadline, if there's not a hard uh, end date to it, then it might not happen or might not happen on the same timeline necessarily. Right. So is there anything different when you write the pattern? You need the graphic skills, right? You, you do. You need the graphic skills. I mean, you know, I've, I've bought some patterns where the graphics were all hand-drawn, you know, I mean, it used to all be hand-drawn, right? When it, people were clipping them out of newspapers. So you can certainly do hand-drawn diagrams. You can hire out the diagrams. Um, you can print it on your home printer if it's a good quality one. You you can do all kinds of different things. Um, the big difference is that you are then 100% responsible for marketing it. Um, and as we talked about when we were talking about handmade goods, marketing is a big part of selling things. So you're responsible for marketing it. You might be responsible for also like distributing it, whether it's a physical pattern or a PDF download. Um, you have to get it to people and have it be available for people to purchase. So you need, again, a marketplace of some sort, whether that's you talking to your local quilt shop and asking if they would please carry your patterns um, or, you know, working with a distributor if you're lucky to get, uh, get in with one. But that's not likely when it's your very first pattern. Um, so you have to find that connection between your product and your customer and somehow bring them together so that they can give you money. So I'm just going to step back for the PDF just a second um, because there's many patterns that I've bought and they're full of mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with that after you've paid for the publishing? Um, like 
or how do you prevent it? How do you, how do you prevent, how do you prevent it? it? Yeah, you prevent it by um, having other people test your pattern. Um, lots of people would be willing to do it just for the joy of having a free pattern. You know, um, for some reason that 10 bucks that pattern costs is a barrier for some people, right? So um, some people will just do it for the joy of being a pattern tester. Some people are so dedicated to our quilting community that they want to find those mistakes before they get out there. And that is the only reward that they need and bless those people. Um, some people do it for pay, you know, you can pay your pattern testers and they're doing a very valuable service and they should get some kind of compensation. Um, and that's between you, the designer and your tester to, you know, discuss what they're comfortable with and what you're comfortable with. And um, yeah, you give it to them, you tell them what, kind of feedback you need and hopefully they find those mistakes before it gets out there into the world. And did you have to, well, I don't know whether you've had any, had any mistakes, but I've got a couple that they have a, a whole area on their website devoted to pattern mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. I've had, I've had a few. Um, and so I do have that section on my website. Um, I've had a typo on the, word throw on the bottom of a pattern that was like a printed pattern and there's like a hundred copies or whatever that say so instead of throw thankfully that's just cosmetic and the reason that got in is because i used to not have the cover made up before i sent it to the testers because it's just the cover <laughs> yeah just the cover <laughs> live and learn yeah um so yeah, so there's, it's mostly, I mean, actually writing the pattern and writing out the steps and all of that, that is the same for both processes. Um, you have to either then take on for yourself the process of, um, of getting it laid out, getting the booklets printed if you're doing booklets, um, getting it onto a website or into people's hands somehow. So I know <laughs> a very big concern of so many people having it in PDF form is that their idea is going to be stolen. Your idea is going to be stolen anyway. <laughs> um, you know, people walk around at quilt shows with their camera and take pictures of the sample quilts. Um, people flip through a pattern in their quilt shop and if somebody wants to steal it, they're going to steal it. Um, you know, if, if somebody buys a physical pattern um, and photocopies it for their friends, your idea is stolen. It, it's just, you know, you can't, you can only protect yourself so much. Um, and the best protection really is to just have a never ending stream of great ideas so that you can move on to the next thing. Um, and if you do want to make hard copies, is there an established publisher that you go with or is there, you just go with anybody? You go with anybody. Um, yeah, you ask for recommendations in your community if there are other people who um, who print patterns or other um, paper booklet type things. I know a lot of quilt pattern designers just print them off at home. Um, that's you know viable for a smaller scale operation for sure. Um, I just like to have it done for me so that I don't have to staple anything or, you know, I also like having it just a little bit more firm. And then how do people find out about your pattern? Uh, yeah, so you've got to let the world know. It's not a if you build it, they will come kind of thing. That only happens in movies with uh, baseball fields, apparently. But people seem to think that, you know, if I have this amazing pattern or this amazing anything, people are going to just buy it. But you've got to get it in front of people's faces. So if you were publishing through a magazine, that publisher has ads that they post on social media. They have a social media person to post about it on social media. They have a whole distribution network with um, bookstores and newsstands. So they get their magazine in front of so many eyeballs. They've got a subscriber list that is so long and tons and tons of followers on Instagram. So you need to do all of those things for yourself. So you have to get it out on your blog, 
um, on your social media and on your website and anywhere else that people can find out about it, even at the bottom of your email. Um, you know, you can say new pattern and have a link to it. Um, so spread it around like glitter everywhere. You want everybody to know that you have a new pattern that is so awesome. Um, if you want to build a little bit of hype as you're getting close to launching it, you can show some sneak peeks. Um, you can get lots of eyeballs on it. Um, if you have your pattern testers, that's another like enormously valuable service that pattern testers provide for us is they have interpreted your pattern in a different way with different fabrics. They've quilted it differently. Um, and they have their own followers on social media that can now be more eyeballs on your product um, and potentially buying the pattern as well. So um, spread it everywhere. Let everybody know. You need to be your own CMO, your own chief marketing officer. And um, that means use everything that is in your stable to get that word out there. And do you, like you had your first pattern, are you finding that your sales increase with every pattern that you put out there? Not with every pattern. Um, I would say it's definitely non-linear. Like some of them uh, get picked up really well and some of them mm, don't. So um, I've always, I mean, you kind of get a feel for it after a few um, that certain ones will sell a little better. Um, I always basically, when I order from my printer, I get the smallest number that I can get um, so that I'm not out a huge chunk of money for paper ones um, and then sitting with uh, a box of patterns taking up space in my home. Um, if something sells out really quickly, then I will go ahead and reorder a much larger quantity, but you know, you don't need to necessarily get that many of them. And like we talked about, you might have a typo on the cover that says, so, um, so, you know, tr start with the smaller quantity and then go from there. There's other ways that you can also, um, help increase the number of eyeballs that are on it. And that can include working with a fabric company to get their fabrics onto your cover quilts. Actually, both of these quilts are fabrics by Juicy Juice, um, and they were generously provided by Andover Fabrics, who I love to work with. Um, and so that's another um, set of people telling the world about the pattern. Um, so it can be more successful when you've got more people promoting it. Obviously, if it's just a really brilliant pattern like this one is, and if you do all of the great marketing things on all of those channels and have all of that glitter happening, um, it can go further than um, if you are just starting out and you've got a thousand followers and you post about it two times, um, then it's, it's harder. Um, so one of the best ways I think for, for creative entrepreneurs to, um, get their products out in front of all of those eyeballs is through Instagram because it is a visual medium and people are looking there for visual inspiration. Um, Pinterest is another great one because it's also visual. Um, but I've found that Instagram is the best way to increase um, my following, to get great feedback from people about my designs as well, um, and to grow a great community, um, and also my business. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different things that need to happen, but um, for, for our visual-based businesses, for um, anything that is a pattern that people would want to, um, you know, they, they would see an example of it um, and before they buy it, Instagram is great for that. I understand that you have a class that you have started for Instagram. Yeah, that's right. I have a course called Ignition uh, that is all about helping new and not so new uh, creative entrepreneurs to use Instagram to start or continue growing their business. 
Instagram is confusing between square posts, videos, carousels, IGTV, lives, and now reels. There are a lot of formats and they all have very specific sizes, durations, and aspect ratios. Add in the fact that it all has to be done from your phone and you're only given one hyperlink and it can feel beyond overwhelming. Every single day I see creative entrepreneurs on Instagram struggling with the same mistakes that I made early on in my business. I see how those mistakes are holding them back and I know how easy it is for them to make small changes for huge results. That's why I created Ignition. To hold your hand through it, show you click by click how to take the steps you need to optimize your profile and create engaging content for your brand. And how do they find you? Uh, you can head over to geekybobbin.com and uh, you can find me there. Obviously, you can also find me on Instagram uh, as Geeky Bobbin. Um, and I'm on YouTube and Facebook as well. Thank you so much for being with us today. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Karen. Take See you care. soon. I just want to thank Bobby so much for being on the show. She answered all my questions so patiently. And if I haven't asked all of the questions that you have, please leave them in the comment section down below. Bobby mentioned her Instagram e-course, and I personally purchased that about three weeks ago. I've gone through it all. In fact, I've gone through it twice. And it's amazing how many tips and tricks there are that you just don't know about. I am sure it will raise my Instagram game. Next on the Quilt Circle will be Peter Byrne, who will be talking about his journey to winning QuiltCon 2020. Thank you so much for showing up today. I really appreciate it. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell beside the subscribe button so YouTube will notify you when I make new videos. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Just Get It Done Quilts. And of course, I have all sorts of free stash buster patterns on my website, JustGetItDoneQuilts.com. So take care, and I'll see you next time.